And my father saw that he had no other option but to just take us all and get out. He had been promised by someone in Germany that if you come and get your children and your wife and move, I promise you that I will get you permanent residencies. And I look up and I say to my dad, I'm like, dad, this is an asylum application. Just to get this straight, you guys were there against your will. You couldn't leave it. We were fooled. You know, we were fooled. Sorry. Let someone interview you for once. It's probably gonna it's probably gonna come up in the episode. Okay. Because you're so used to being the one asking the I know, questions. remember our phone call? I was <laughs> You were the one asking questions. And I'm like, I am the one that's supposed to be asking <laughs> questions. Sometimes I wouldn't sleep just thinking, what if this happens? What if I don't know, uh, what if I'm in the middle of a shooting, which I have been? What if um Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just um, you leaving your podcast, your life, your career, your family, your friends. And the, in the span of a week, you have to make that decision to leave everything and go restart. Should I ask you the question? Look. Let someone interview you for once. It's probably gonna. It's probably going to come up in the episode. Okay. Because you're so used to being the one asking the I know. Questions. Remember our phone call? I was. <laughs> you were the one asking questions. And I'm like, I am the one that's supposed to be asking <laughs> questions. You ready? Ready. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to a new episode of the Mo Show podcast. We're in my cousin's restaurant in Dubai, new Turkish restaurant. If you're into your breakfast, into your brunch vibes, he opened three months ago. It's called Bazlama. So thank you so much, Bazlama, for having us uh, record in, uh, in your beautiful restaurant. Are you a fan of Turkish? I'm a big fan of Turkish food. Not just Turkish food, like Turkey itself, the coffee, the whole vibe. Tea Turkey. as well. At some point, tea, I want yeah, to yeah. pour you a cup of the tea. The tea is intense. And anyone else who wants a cup. Um, <laughs> so this is what they do. You arrive in the restaurant and then it's, it's a standard thing. You They serve you this whether you want it or not. And then things just come out every five minutes. No way. You have like these manaishes and minmins and timtims like stuff that i've never even come across in my life Yum. but it's delicious if you like your shakshuka your scrambled eggs your turkish eggs with the sausages oh my god i know where i'm coming for breakfast me too Sarah. <laughs> it's so good <laughs> Wallah. it really really is good um tayyib well first of all i want to say thank you for uh for agreeing to come on the show you uh, you reached out to me with that. It was exactly, I went back to the Instagram conversation. It was exactly six months ago yeah. to the date. And um, and I actually took notes of the message that you wrote, if you don't mind me yeah, yeah, sure. reading it out. Yeah. Uh, the message that you sent to me six months ago exactly, it was March 24th, you said, Hi Mo, I've been contemplating telling my story for a while, two years to be precise. This was the first time I plan to talk about it. I don't want to do it for me, but I want to do it for others who are suffering as well. I've been approached by several big news networks, platforms, but I honestly wanted to tell my story on your show as I felt it would be most personal and in line with how I want to tell my story. Let me know what you think. And I was like, first of all, I was so touched by that. <laughs> By, by, by the fact that you chose me, that you wanted to tell your story through my platform to my audience. Because it's an authentic platform. Very kind of you. Uh, and I, I feel it like it's heartfelt that you say that it's an authentic uh, show. I, I try to be as much as I can myself. In yeah. the moment I feel that I'm not being myself in an episode, I'll bin it. Yeah. I, I won't publish it if that's not at least why. Because if I'm not being myself, the guests can't be themselves. Yeah. So I appreciate you for recognizing that and saying that. It's just the truth. Uh, yeah, and it, really. I, and, I, and I feel that it's, that it's very genuine from you. So thank you. Well, here we are today. And I like, not I like, I've been trying out this new question for uh, my episodes. And I thought we should start with this question. Okay. What do I have to understand about you in your early days, stuff that you've been through, to understand the person who's sitting in front of me today. So when, when you're saying early days, you mean childhood or do you mean the teenage years? What do you mean exactly? You know, when any when, when, when someone ever asks me to elaborate on the question, I typically respond in saying, you know, how about we leave it open-ended and subject to interpretation? Okay. So answer it in the best way you feel that you are comfortable with. Yeah. Something... And, and, and just to repeat the question, because it's quite a deep one. What do I need to know about your early years 
to understand you, the person who's sitting in front of me today? I was a very sensitive child. That's like, I was known for being extremely, extremely, extremely sensitive as a child, not just with the things that affect me, also with the things that affect the people around me, the people who love, who I love. Uh, if I was upset for any sort of reason or any sort of uh, incident that had happened, I remember I would go into my room as a child and I would just sit under the bed covers and just isolate from the entire world for a good two or three hours just to like take it, take all these emotions in. I was also very smart as a child. I would analyze a lot. I would, you know, I was introverted weirdly as a child. Now I'm, I'm kind of the opposite. So I would like watch everyone, watch every single thing, analyze in my head, try to find answers, try to find solutions for problems. You know, as a child, that's not what a child is supposed to do. So I grew up, I had to grow up earlier than um, I was supposed to. So I think that's what you should like understand about my early years to understand who's sitting in front of you right now, because I took these two aspects, the sensitivity and, you know, the analyzing personality, and they're still with me till this very day. Growing up in Saudi and being born there, uh, I was actually with my entire family. They were all there, like my mom, my dad, my grandma, my grandfather, my aunts, my uncles, they were all there. So the environment was kind of still like, it was as if I was born in Lebanon, but I also like um, took with me the Saudi aspects. Um, so yeah, I mean, in my family, it's it's kind of common, not very common to have these two personality traits. I see it with my father a lot. I see it with my baby brother. But in Lebanon, it is very common because we come from a country where there's a lot of, you know, atrocities. There's a lot of problems, a lot of uh, unrest, you know, a political or social unrest. So people kind of have to grow that kind of personality out of them so that they can, um, you know, like cope with the status quo. They have to be their own um, saviors, if you want. No one's taking care of anyone over there. So it's a complete chaos. So yeah, I think it's like a defense mechanism that we all have to grow up with in that country to kind of like live a sane, safe life. Otherwise, we're in trouble, whether it's socially, you know, like uh, wherever you go, wherever you walk on the street, people can take advantage of you. People can, uh, I don't know, rob you. They can, uh, the situation in Lebanon, especially right now, it's horrendous. So having that kind of smartness, uh, you know, if you want to put it like that, is essential to survive. Uh, that wittiness. Street smart. Street smart, that kind of witty personality, I think that's the key to survive, you know, such harsh countries. Otherwise, that's, that's not going to look pretty. It reconfirms the old saying in so many ways that life isn't fair. Yeah. And, and if you are fortunate enough to be in a country, growing up in a country that is safe, you will never know what it's like to grow up in a country that isn't. I know. I know. I, because you know why I know? Because I've lived both. Because I've lived both. I know exactly what it means to live in a safe country that fosters you, fosters your needs, that protects you, that respects you as an individual. And I've lived in a country where you don't even exist as an individual. You're not respected. You have zero rights. It's crazy, the, the difference that I've seen in my life. But yeah, I understand that. I understand what you're saying extremely. So, That's a very unique position to be in because most people either they're in that difficult environment where it's turmoil, where it's hardships, where, you know, to some degree, maybe you don't know when you're, if we look at the Syrian situation today, yeah. you, you don't know where your next meal is going to come from. I know. Like whenever I'm in Saudi and I'm going to Lebanon, the amount of anxiety that I have on that flight, or just the day even before, I w sometimes I wouldn't sleep, just thinking, what if this happens? What if, I don't know, uh, what if I'm in the middle of a shooting, which I have been? What if... Um, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. What happened? I mean, it's not once. It's not once. That's a whole other, like... <laughs> in the middle of a mass shooting and you're... In the middle of a mass shooting, in the middle of a mini war in Beirut. I think it was 2021. It was 2021. I was reporting there for a news channel, a news TV channel. And I was... They, they called me. They were like, we need you down there. And at the time, I was someone who was, um, you know, reckless. I would... Uh, I was like, you know what? Yeah, I'll do it. And I went down there and it was in between two areas of different um, political alignments Beirut. and Beirut, in the middle of Beirut. And 
I just found myself in the middle of a mass shooting. They were shooting. I was in the middle of, so there's basically two areas next to each other. They were in a fight. And I was right in the street in the middle. And I remember hiding in a beauty salon for, I, I spoke about this in my video on Instagram. I, I hid in a beauty salon for a good two or three hours. I was calling the TV channel. I'm like, I can't go out there. I had my gear on, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't safe enough to go out and report. I was like, this and that is happening. So <laughs> that's your news. I'm out of here. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. I was in the middle of it for two to three hours. And I saw the shooters. Like, I saw them running across the street. But th thankfully, the owner of the beauty salon locked up and just, like, closed. And we were all just stuck inside for, like, good three hours with just two bottles of water, I remember. I was, like, I was thinking in my head, what if this goes on for, like, an entire night? What, I'm gonna, what am I going to do? What am I going to tell my mom? She's uh, uh, up there at home not knowing where I am or what I'm doing. Yeah, I, no I normally wouldn't tell my parents where I am at the time because they would go crazy. I would tell them after that, you know, this and that happened today and then they would just lose minds. So, yeah, that's a, that's literally like just one day of the, the hell I was in. <laughs> Scariest moment of your life? No. No? Oh, you're full of secrets. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That I wasn't my scariest. My scariest moment was the second that August 4 port blast went off in Beirut. Because at that moment, I was not sure, genuine, like literally, I was not sure whether I was alive or I was gone. And this is the, the space where you're at between life and death. You know, I was just like trying to pinch myself, trying to head myself to figure out if I'm still here or not. How far from head from, to toe. How far from no. the blast? How far from the blast? In kilometers, I was like three kilometers away. Three kilometers. Three kilometers. We're talking about a blast that was heard in Cyprus from Beirut. That was the smoke of the blast was seen in Damascus. The 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 the, the magnitude of this blast. I don't. People don't talk about it that much. It's. I mean, right now they used to talk about it, but right now it's kind of like forgotten. The magnitude of this blast. It was something that is out of this world i still suffer till this day from that from the day of that blast. i believe you were there on the day yeah ptsd i think i think it, yeah. 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 yeah yeah i was actually diagnosed 90 days after with ptsd because um, you know when when something that that huge happens your body goes into fight or flight and your stress hormones just spike so my stress hormones spiked at the time and then they were stuck at that level up until now. I even developed vitiligo, which is like a condition where my skin pigments no longer like give the color to my skin. So I have like white patches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was the scariest moment because I generally thought I was dead. And then not only that, I was just anticipating or waiting for the next bomb. Because usually when things like this happen, the bomb was so huge, I was, I was three kilometers away, but I thought that my building was the building that was exploding and a lot of people said the same thing at the time that's how loud it was you it, thought that it detonated in the building that you were in let me tell you something when i heard that sound i thought it was yom al qiyama i thought a note the world was ending i i cannot explain to you the feeling i felt because i've heard bombs i've lived two wars in lebanon i've lived 2006 I've lived 2013 or 12, I think, in the north of Lebanon. I've heard explosions. I've heard like small bombs detonating. I've heard that kind of stuff. But that bomb was out of this world. It was, it's indescribable. Every single interview I've watched on people talking about their experience on this day, they speak about the sound of the bomb. Never did this ever happen before in any kind of war. Like the sound of the explosion was horrendous. I've seen the water ripple. I've seen the video of, of people on the jet ski that jumped into the water. It it really did look like if, if you were there and you were there, I could see what you meant by it felt like the end of days. Yeah, 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 yeah. A hundred percent. So what were you doing when it when it happened? I was actually a funny story. Um, so there was protests at the time going on. I was covering these protests and there was a protest at the time going on in the ministry of I don't remember what ministry, but people were kind of protesting for some decision that was made. And I had friends down there at that, sp at that specific location. And that location was literally facing the port. It was literally like two streets across the port. And I was watching the videos on Instagram. I usually go 
to, to protests to cover. So I, when I was watching these videos, I saw that things were kind of getting escalated. So I speak to my friend, I remember, and I said to him, what's going on? Like, what's going on down there? Are you there? Are you at the protest? He's like, yeah, I am. Come down. I'm like, OK. So as I was getting ready to go to that protest, then that's when that like explosion went off. And I remember I called my friend who was down there because in my mind, the explosion was right next to me. Keep in mind, like I thought he was fine. I called him, I'm like, come here right now. His name is Khadr. I'm like, Khadr, come here right now. I'm gonna, like, I'm dying, I'm gonna die. He's like, what, what are you talking about? I can't come, like there was an explosion right next to me. I'm like, no, it was next to me. He was like, there's two explosions. I'm like, no, there's one, expl what, two, what other, is there an explosion next to you? And that's when my mind started like rushing. There's two explosions, that means there's another one coming. Where is it gonna hit? Like what's happening? Did the war start? What's going on? That's and the scariest thing, not knowing what the Not knowing what's happening. And are you close to it or not? Exactly. No human should have to go through such thoughts. I know. And then, you know, in my mind, خلص, the war is starting in Lebanon because they were anticipating one. And I was like, it's starting, starting in Beirut. I'm, gonna, I'm in the middle of it. My friends are in trouble. I'm in trouble. What am I going to do? My mind's just like a thousand, a thousand thoughts at the same second. The first thing I do is I send my mom a message. And I say to her, I'm fine. Like on WhatsApp, I WhatsApp her saying I'm fine. Bravo. And then she had no idea what's going on. She was in the north of Lebanon. She was like, sure, fine. What do you mean you're fine? And then she starts panicking. Like, why are you telling me you're fine? What, what's happening to you? And then like all the lines, they stopped and then no one was answering their phones. My mom went crazy. So after that, Khudr came because I locked myself in the bathroom in my apartment. So as soon as Khudr arrived at my place, like he's my best friend, he arrived at my place. That's when I went out and I opened the door. I'm like, what's happening? He's like, I don't know. And then I just start crying because I was dead scared. Like I've never been this scared. You don't know if you're gonna die. Like you, you could die at any second. Like it's the scariest thing. I would, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemies, truly. And then, the first thing Khadr told me was, "Let's go down." Like, wh what, what should we do? I'm like, "Yeah, let's go down." We went down, and the entire city was glass everywhere. It was just glass everywhere. People were like, "Alhamdulillah, nothing happened to me physically. Yeah. Very minor energy uh, injuries." Yeah. But when I, when I went down to that street. Um, I saw people carrying their own, like this is this is a bit too sensitive. I don't know if I want to go into details, but it was horrendous. Like it this was. This was three kilometers from the blast. This was three kilometers. And glass shattered. Oh my God! The glass was shattered in the airport, which was like ten kilometers away from the port. I, I mean, glass was shattered in the mountains around the port. And that, the 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 pressure that that came out of the explosion was it's indescribable. So yeah, the first thing we did was we went to the hospitals, me and him, uh, just what can we do? Everyone was outside of the emergency room. There was no more capacity in any hospital in Beirut. They were taking people from that city to cities two hours and three hours away to hospitalize them yep. for help. And then the day right after we got like international help, like they started arriving from all countries around the world. Um, yeah, I mean, it was uh, it's a vague memory because of all the... The, the the shocks, you know, the constant shocks, what about like they were consecutive. First the blast and then when I went down and I saw that city all in glass, like that's my city and it's all in glass. Like people were like carrying themselves, carrying their children. People were shouting like looking for their children, looking for their siblings, looking for their parents, looking for... It was catastrophic. It was apocalyptic is what it is, honestly. So and and it stays with you for for weeks and months and and you talk about it right now uh, and it's three years ago was it four years ago? Yes, three years ago. Yeah, I'm, 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 you know you're not over it uh, because you can't unsee it, you can't unfeel it, you can't unhear what what you know what you went through. Um, yeah, it rocked the world, not just Beirut, by the way. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, I always it, like to ask people. So this is where I ask you, <laughs> because it could. Ha if if you are an empathetic person, and you know maybe we don't have enough of those people on on this planet, but if you're an empathetic person, you would feel that this could have been your city. Yeah. Beirut is is maybe the unlucky city that it, this happened in for whatever reason, but it could have been anyone's city. 
Exactly. And uh, and if all you take from it is prayers for those on the ground and and being thankful for your security, then that's like the you know the, the minimum the gratitude minimum. yeah that you can give. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, I mean, <clears throat> sorry. Um, this has kind of shifted into being the purpose kind of of my life just like accommodating to what people what people's sufferings are after that day because imagine seeing just imagine it really just imagine it seeing your own people suffer and die right in front of you suffer and die we're not talking about unemployment we're not talking about you know some economic uh, hardships we're talking about death here it's not it's not like it's not a joke you know what I mean? So nobody, uh, nobody should have to go through that. Nobody, yeah. nobody at all. The human body wasn't designed to go through that. Exactly. That's why. <laughs> that's why I am uh, in the in the state I am right, I'm in right now with the PTSD. Yeah. And me and a lot of people. It's not just me. It's a lot of people. Not just in Lebanon. All over the world, especially where war happens. That's a lot of people. You know. So. <laughs> دوامها خفيف وهش وطعمها ولا اروع Why journalism? It started in my country in Lebanon. So uh, October 17, 2019. I was not in Lebanon at the time, but an uprising started to because people were were fed up with their economic situation they were fed up with a lot of the political unrest that was happening they were demanding reforms i was going down there you know after i came back to lebanon the protests were still happening so i was going down there not to not to just participate but also to kind of take that image and give it to the rest of the world kind of to like transmit that image or that reality to the rest of the world so i would go down there And I would just open my Instagram live. I would just go live from the protests, I remember. And wherever there's riots or any kind of escalation, you would find me right in the middle of that because I genuinely wanted to like deliver that image to the world. I wanted the world to know what's happening to the Lebanese people. So I did that for a few months and my Instagram blew up. People were coming on my Instagram, watching my lives, sending me DMs, asking me political questions, asking me like, what's gonna happen? What are you guys doing here? What are you guys doing there? Like, we wanna support, how can we help, blah, blah, blah. So I gained, I kind of gained, my page kind of gained some popularity because of that. And after that, I was contacted by a TV station. And they asked me to join them, to be on their team in a certain program uh, that is socio-political, to kind of like set up the program and Uh, you know, to report for them and not just open my Instagram live and show that the world was happening. Uh, so I did because it was uh, it was a greater audience. It was more reach and uh, it fulfilled my goal, which was show people what the hell was going on. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was... Uh, so your individual effort via Instagram live got the attention of a network who employed you. Exactly. I think the reason was because a lot of people were going live during the... Pro everyone was going live during the process. But the thing is, you would literally find me in the middle of the problems where everyone would run away. I would go, I would try my best. I'm not going to say I was in the middle of these problems. Like, I wasn't putting my life at risk, but I would try to take a good spot where I'm covered and shielded and just like open the live, zoom in and just show what's happening. I wasn't scared from that position. Calculated. It was calculating. We go back to the being yeah. anal analytical. Yeah. Calculated risks. Yeah. It's calculated, exactly. Yeah. That's the word for it. It was calculated risks. Were you always so... Two two things. Were you always so daring and, 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 and maybe pushing the limits to some degree in addition to being a truth seeker? No. no, no. I'm trying to see where did this... Not, not to be all like I'm a therapist because I'm not. I know. But like, I'm, I'm trying to see where, where was the spark or was it out of love for Lebanon to document and transmit what is happening on the ground to the world did you feel like it was a nat national duty more than it it was a national duty but i do have a theory uh not everyone was on the ground at the time there's a reason for that there's a reason for that i don't think that 
the sole reason was my patriotism. I think it's deeper. I think it's bigger. Um, as a child, I would, I mean, I was bullied in school. You know, I would, I was a people pleaser. I would not say no. I would just like go with the flow with what, whatever, you know, hardship I'm going through. I would not know how to stand my ground, my ground. So I learned that saying no when it's necessary is important. And saying yes when it's necessary is also important. And I learned that there was a certain event that happened in my life where I was like, that's it. No more, no more. And I linked a lot of some of my family problems in terms of our situation um, financially in Lebanon. Uh, also my, my, my close relatives and my far relatives and my friends, you know, and the, co the colleagues I had at the time and the acquaintances, everyone was going through a hard time. And I just linked that source and I decided like, it's time to say no, like till when are we gonna be just like people who go with the flow and just like accept our fate. This doesn't have to be our fate. And when I was in that mindset and the first day was hard, the first day was scary. I'm not gonna lie to you. When I went down there on the first day, I was like, what am I doing? What What is all this? Why, like, is this gonna, result in anything and then when I saw like the gravity of thousands of people chanting one thing and that solidarity it's you can never undo that you can never let go of that you can never let go of that feeling so that nationalism and that like patriotism it was multiplied by 1000 when you see that an entire people are asking for the same thing they're asking for their basic human rights I wanted to be a part of that battle. So I think during that moment, something just flipped in my head. And I was like, no more, no more sitting at home and just like watching people suffer. Screw the desk job. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> when you speak about it, I, 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 I feel the patriotism and almost like I can, I can feel you getting goosebumps and it lights a fire inside of you when you speak about being on the ground, documenting, risking your life for the greater good of the people in the country. Yeah. Especially when you said that, you know, everyone chanting one thing. Yeah. Like the fire in your eyes is, t it, it's telling that you in some way or another love what you do. You feel your purpose. I do. I do. And in some way or another, I'm standing up to everything I did not stand up for earlier in my life. So I think that's the psychology behind it because the friends I've made during that period of time, they, they've all had a certain phase in their life where they were diminished or they were, they were like um, looked down upon and they did nothing about it. So all of that came out for Lebanon and it was for, for a good purpose, I guess. We got there in the end. Yeah, we did. That's, ex that's exactly why you started it. Of course. Because you felt, for lack of a better word, muzzled or you kept things inside and you're growing up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. And today you want to knock the bully out. Yeah, exactly. And, and you have by putting yourself in ground zero. Yeah. And uh, listen, it's not just about the protests or Lebanon. It's every day. It's, it's become who I am. It's become my lifestyle. No to bullies, no to being, um, uh, I don't know, like uh, looked down upon, no to condescending behavior, no to not achieving my right, not getting my rights, my absolute rights, no to that. I think if you see someone getting bullied today, you'd lose your shit. Oh my God. Oh my, I better not see anyone getting it's bullied. It's a form of PTSD. Oh my God, I would not be able to control it. I've seen, I've actually like, uh, you just reminded me of something. Uh, I was once walking down a street, it's a famous street in Lebanon. It's full of restaurants. Jameza. Exactly. Thank you. Jameza. Jameza. Okay. <laughs> so I was walking down that street and I saw there's a lot of kids, uh, Syrian kids, lots of nationalities who just sit there. They sell, uh, they sell flowers. They do that for a living. They sell flowers. They sell um, gum. They sell uh, so many things. So they're just children at the end of the day. They did not make that decision. And they could sometimes act in childish ways because they're children, like run around, scream, you know, all these kind of things that we used to do as kids. People sometimes would kind of 
they would get bothered by that. And one time I saw a man grabbing that kid from his shirt and just like swaying him left and right and going like, stop screaming, stop running. And I looked at that man, I was alone, walking alone at night. And I was looked at him, I was like, let go of that child. Let go of that child. And he was like, sorry? <laughs> Lavani, they were like, sorry? I'm like, let go of that child right now before you see something that you don't want to see. And he let go of the child. He was kind of scared. He was like, I okay. He saw your eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I swear to God. And then I see my friend because he was coming to pick me up from that spot. And he, see, he goes like, what's going on? I'm like, he was swaying that child with his shirt. He's like, don't do that. Like, no, don't ever do it. So what I'm trying to say is I will never, ever be quiet when I see something that's unfair happening. What did your friend say? Don't what? No, he said to the man, like, you don't want to mess with her. Like, don't. Me-. Because at the time, you know, I was able to kind of like escalate it and take it to places where uh, at the time there was like a wave of exposing people who would abuse children or abuse other segments of society. And I was, you know, kind of like involved in that in some way or another. I was kind of like supporting people and being their voice, if you will say. So, uh, yeah, he, he, was, he looked at him. He was like, you don't want to mess with her. <laughs> you chose the wrong person tonight. <laughs> I don't think he ever came back to Jamaica ever. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I like that. I love, I love. In that message that you sent me six months ago to the day, you said that you hit rock bottom three years ago in 2021. That's true. A few reactions to that. Uh, three reactions. The first one is what took you to rock bottom? Okay. So what took me to rock bottom was, you know how I was just telling you about everything that was happening in Lebanon, the the, the purpose I had in my life, the goal I had, you know, me wanting to just be present there and to, to help others and to just fight for the for that cause. I had to drop it all in the span of in the span of one week. I had to make a decision to drop it all and leave for good. Lebanon. Yeah, to leave Lebanon for good. And because that cause was a part a part of me, I felt like I was letting, I was keeping a piece of myself in that country and leaving. And I had made that decision in a week and it was probably the hardest decision I've ever made, also the best decision I've ever made. So that was where I hit rock bottom. I was just letting go, but still not healing from what had happened. So it was kind of like an open, an open wound, if you will say. Um, can I ask why you had to leave Lebanon? And if you don't want to tell me... You know, no, no, tell. it's fine. I can tell you. So what made you have to leave? The unsafety. That was um, a few months after the August 4 blast. Before that, I was aware that it was an unsafe situation, but not to this extent. Um, my family also, they were losing their minds. They were telling me to get out. My dad was like, get out of Lebanon. I don't care if you have to leave journalism, if you don't find anything in journalism in Saudi or in the UAE as soon as you can. I'll get you a job anywhere in any other sector. Just get out of there. Ufalan, he got me a job in the automotive industry. And I got out of there and I joined that sector for a few months before I reestablished myself as a journalist in Saudi. So that was rock bottom for me because not only was I letting go of my career, I was letting go of the cause. I was leaving my family behind, my friends. I felt like I literally had an everyday talk with myself about what are you doing? Are you taking the right decision? What's going on? You can go back at any second, just go back, just do it. And then that internal like conflict I had with myself, that was really, really, it really took a toll on my mental health. You know? Major crossroads for you, yeah, yeah. life, career, Everything. 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 In the, in, in the span of a week, imagine. That's just imagine. Insane. Just imagine. You leaving your podcast, your life, your career, your family, your friends. And in the, in the span of a week, you have to make that decision to leave everything and go restart. That's scary. I mean, that's, that's not easy at all. No, so. no, 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 no. Far from it. So where'd you go? Saudi. You moved to Saudi. Yeah. To my hometown. <laughs> To back to Jeddah, actually, um, it was the shift was relatively okay because you know I was 
born and bred over there. I had some friends there. Um, I'm familiar with Jeddah. I love Jeddah. Not only am I familiar, I love Jeddah. Thank you. We, we, we try to make it as cousins as <laughs> my whole town as well. No, no. I mean, like, honestly. It, it's yeah. chilled. It's relaxed. It's home. Yeah. It's know. home. Yeah. It's home. Um, yeah, yeah. Saudi has brought to me a lot of a lot of good things, honestly. Saudi and its people and its cities and its streets. Like when I go to Jeddah, I feel like I'm in peace, I'm home. I love it there. I love it, genuinely. So uh, the, the shift wasn't that bad, but just the idea of like leaving everything behind, that was also, that was not easy at all. But alhamdulillah, no, it was at a place like Saudi, not somewhere completely new to me yeah there was a bit of uh, there was a lot of familiarity of course a yeah. lot a lot and when did things start to change for the better like when did you feel okay you know what now um i'm, I'm happy with where i am and and the move was for the good so i think that started when i moved from Jeddah to Riyadh. i joined arab news i was a business journalist for arab news for quite a while um, I started, you know, attending a lot of conferences, covering a lot of events, writing articles. My life started to make a bit more sense. I was doing something that was kind of familiar, not, I mean, not in the same, um, um, I lost the word. <laughs> I know what you're saying. Not in the same context department. Yeah, I was a political reporter. Now I'm a business journalist. So it wasn't in the same like context. But it was still journalism, and it was something I loved to do. I developed a love for journalism because of what I did before. So that love stayed, even though it was different. Uh, it was different context. And most likely, you were very, very good at it because you loved what you were doing. Exactly, exactly. Because uh, I'll get to you. I'll get to that part. Um, <clears throat> so when I joined Arab Arab News, that was a huge milestone for me. Arab News is a very well reputable. Uh, inst news institution. I had the privilege of being a business journalist for them. And then I got another um, opportunity to go to CNN Business uh, here in Dubai. Um, CNN is, you know, uh, it's like every journalist's uh, dream uh, to report to such a huge media institution. Yeah, I've, um, I've, I've heard of them. I've heard of them. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard of them too at the time. Yeah, I had heard of them. I was like, you know what? Let's give them a shot. <laughs> So I took that, I took, I jumped at that milestone. Um, I took it, I moved to Dubai. That's when things started to kind of feel a bit better. I met uh, Rani, who's currently my husband in Dubai. Um, we started our lives together here. I feel a bit more, you know, at peace, stable. Um, I've regained some, some, sort, some sort of purpose, not entirely, but some sort of purpose after getting married. So, yeah, then now I'm here talking to you on the motion. <laughs> you happy? Uh, happy. So happy, I think it's a big word. I think it's a big word. No, I'm not. But there's phases. So it's about, fa it's about the phase I'm in in my life. There's phases where I am happy. There's phases where I'm like, what, what is this all for? what is the purpose of life? like this existential crisis kind of like lures lures its way back in um but in a general sense if you want to talk about like the percentage of the time i am mostly happy mostly but there's that doesn't necessarily mean that it's made the majority of the time um it could be like 60 percent, maybe 60 percent happy 40 percent unhappy so who on earth is happier more than 60 percent of the time i don't know if, if i get 60 percent i i I'm happy yeah. with, with that result. I know. No, I mean, happy. That's my goal. In life. 60%. 70, yeah. I feel like is unattainable. You know, not, not to label anything as impossible, but 60, I would take that. Yeah. So, you know what? Now that I think of it, I think, <laughs> I think that's, uh, I think it's not 60. I think it's kind of like 50. Honestly, it's like half of the time. Yeah. Half of the time, I'm not happy. Half of the time, I'm scared. I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm kind of like at a roadblock. Uh, in so many senses in my career, in my personal life, in my so many things. So happy, that's, an, that's very ambitious, honestly.
Seneca said, we suffer more in imagination than we do in reality. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you just think, if, if we take a second to think how much we have thought of negative things that never ended up coming true, but we paid the price for it by worrying about it. Suffer more in imagination than reality. It's one of my favorite, favorite lines of, uh, of all time. It's pretty so, interesting. So if you watch your thoughts, the moment you start picking up a negative thought and you stop yourself there, this is what I mean by watching, uh, I saw that, stop. What stop. if you can't stop yourself though? That's, that's, where you, that's where practice needs to come in. You need to control it. You need to do it once for it to be practiced. Just, just control it. Okay, I, 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 I acknowledge the negative thought that just came into my mind. Let's look at the bright side of that. What if that doesn't happen and actually something good happens? Ah, you, you roadblocked it. You know, you, you put a barrier so it doesn't infiltrate into, you know, the, the next fear-based scenario. plan. That's something that I, when I picked up on and I'm starting, I notice my happiness levels approaching that 50% mark, that 55% mark. I do this full time right now. Yeah. I have this, I have my family. Yeah. No longer in my day job. So reducing, reducing how much was on my plate has upped my happiness level to now the 50% mark. Mm. So, and that's another thing, like how much are we asking? How much are you asking of yourself to take on in life? I wanted to ask you something as you were speaking can I be very like transparent and blunt? I beg you. Do you think, don't you think that that's a little bit hard to achieve? Where a lot of people like stopping your negative thoughts, watching your thoughts, controlling what you think about, uh, just uh, putting an end to these negative thoughts. And, uh, and when you practice, uh, you know, uh, just limiting the kinds of thoughts that you get and the, the, the amount of thoughts the amount of these thoughts, specific thoughts that you get, no one would have been depressed, right? No one would have been on pills, antidepressants. No one would have been diagnosed with, I don't know, maybe I'm just like thinking out loud with you here. It's a, it's a great point. And, yeah, and, I mean. And, and, and if I can just interject for a second and then, and then you can continue. I appreciate that people have been dealt a harder hand in life. Those who live in war-torn countries and those who live in areas where all they hear is birds all day. I get that yeah. and I appreciate that yeah. 100%. Yeah. And I'm not going to be insensitive to the fact that, you know, what about people who live in war zones, Moshe? They just think positive things. You know, I don't know what that's like. Yeah. And, and, and I pray that any country that is in war today is no longer in war by tomorrow. Yeah. You know what I mean? But if you have the ability, you know, if you are safe, um, comfortable to some degree with life, with your marriage, with your job, with your income, if you have enough things to be grateful for, I think practicing the art of positivity yeah, like a muscle, like going to the gym. And it's pretty hard. Constantly. Yes, it is. But if you practice it, the 10,000 hour rule, doing something repeatedly, you know, it's not going to be, you're not going to get it the first day, you're not going to get it the first month. But if you practice positivity, I think just like growing you know, a muscle or getting into shape, repetition will outdo, repetition will get you the results you want. Repeti repetition will result in a habit. Do, do you know, like, I can speak for myself, my episode one and two, I, I see it now. I, was, I wasn't I was as good as, as I am now. I wasn't as comfortable as I am now. Yeah. I was very conscious of the cameras. So re repetition of staying positive, repetition of going to the gym, repetition of- Even if you of, don't feel like it. Even if you don't feel yeah. like it. You know, I've, I've, there's a study, there's a study that I don't know if you're aware of it, but um, they tried that on a group of people who had depression and they asked them to smile, even if they don't want to smile yeah. for a certain amount of days. Um, a, a, a big amount of these people eventually, they, the, their depression was gone just because they were smiling because you're tricking your brain to think that you're okay and that you're, you're happy, you're smiling. So a certain kind of hormone was being um, like, uh, what's the word for it? A certain kind of hormone was being released. Yes, that's the word. <laughs> Brain block. <laughs> it's okay. Um, Have some tea. Yeah, it's <laughs> I should. It's Turkish. Uh, so, so a big amount of people of these of that kind of like sample of people, they were treated from their depression because they were smiling. Even <laughs> that's a lot of smoke. And so even when they didn't want to smile, they just kept smiling. Just so kept that's smiling. when the idea of repetition and working on it, consciously 
putting yourself in that state. And my husband has that a lot. I'm struggling. To <laughs> to, thank you. I'm struggling to kind of like have that habit because... If it was easy, everyone would do it. Not just that, because with realism comes a lot of tra challenges. With being a realist, with being a risk calculator all the time, that comes with a lot of baggage. Um, I, I tend to see the negative of every single thing, just so that I can calculate the risk, calculate the exit plan, or calculate you know how I'm going to survive whatever might happen. Smart, smart. It's smart, but it's so it's. I don't think it's, it should be the, the majority of my thinking span. It shouldn't, but if you look at it as a gift, there's a great book called The Gift of Fear. If fear is a gift, or else we probably wouldn't survive our adolescence. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So being wary and conscious of the risk factors and what the conclusion of doing something that is, that is risky and how that might end up is, is very worthwhile to be aware of. Unless it's crippling, though. Unless it's crippling. I stopped working for a good five months because of that fear. Um, it sometimes it is pretty crippling. It can halt everything you're doing. Just because I had the fear of getting out of my bedroom at one point after the blast. So <laughs> I couldn't socialize. If I would go to a cafe, I would listen. I would like the coffee machine, the people talking, the cars parking, the cars honking outside. Uh, every single, the door is closing and opening. I would hear that all simultaneously. And I would feel so overwhelmed. And I would just like fear, like, what's going on? What, is, what was that loud slam? It was probably just the door. Just like, calm down. That's how I would talk to myself. What got you through it? What was your medicine? I went to therapy. Therapy. Oh, yeah. I, I had to do therapy for a good two years. I was prescribed um, some medication, but I refused to take those. I, yeah. I like that. I refused to take I like that. You kept it natural. I kept it natural. I strengthened my bond with God. That helped a lot. A so lot. Did you hear that? A lot, a lot. You have no it's idea. Everything. It's everything. Salah is, um, it's, it's, it's so many things and it's also therapy. You know what? I, I was just having this conversation with my uh, sister the other day. Mm. Manifestation and uh, speaking things into reality and all of that. They, all of these things that are now being so, so widely spoken about. It's everywhere. It's in the West. It's in the East. It's in the North and the South. This was present in our religion and a lot of other religions for a very long time. For a very long time. So, uh, I mean, that kind of manifestation, that kind of gratitude, practicing that gratitude, just acknowledging that that higher power exists, nurturing it, building that bond, understanding that what you have is is extremely it's 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 a blessing everything that you you possess no matter what it is genuinely because i was put in a situation in my life where i had nothing and that made me realize that even a sip of water i swear to god a sip of water could be a child's dream can you imagine that can you imagine that so when I started practicing and when I started like strength, strengthening that bond with God and practicing the prayer itself, not just the faith, the prayer, the actual practice of the prayer as a form of, you know, getting closer to God. It is a form of meditation for to a certain extent. It's many things. So I, I didn't need the pills. <laughs> Although I, you know, I told you earlier, my hormone levels were my cortisol levels, my other... There, was, there were other hormones that are stress-induced. They were through the roof, but I didn't take any pills. I'm so but it happy. took me a longer time. took me a longer time, to be fair. But it's fine. You went the natural way. Yeah. One of the things that, that really drives me up the wall in life, many things do, but one of the things now that you kind of like tiptoed on the subject is antidepressants. I don't know. What do you think about antidepressants? I want to put my fist through a doctor's head and describe... <laughs> That prescribes it to anyone <laughs> because because you all you do is develop a tolerance to it yeah not one person who i knew that has had antidepressants has ever come out at the end of it having been better off than they Seriously. were without yeah. Yeah. yeah they say that they regulate your dopamine and serotonin levels but what i think actually happens from a lot of people i've said i'm not a doctor i'm not giving any medical advice but from my from what i've witnessed with other people when they get off of these medications, 
their brain was programmed or conditioned in a way whereby it needs an external pill to induce these happy hormones. And when you're off of these pills, even if you stop them gradually, your brain won't be able to kind of like no. release the same happy hormones. So doing it naturally is the best. It's a longer way, but it's... It's the right way. It's, yeah, it's more sustainable. Yeah. It uh, goes a longer way. Another one of the big things that you mentioned to me um, was life in a German refugee camp. How old were you when you were there? How did you end up there? And what was life like at the camp? Um, I, I Sorry if I giggle. I giggle because I <laughs> cannot fathom. I cannot imagine. Like we see this in movies. Yeah. And here you are about to explain to me what life is like in a refugee camp. Mic drop. <laughs> Mic drop. Um, so that was 2019. That was Right, right before Corona, COVID happened. Um, I was, I think I was nineteen at the time. My my youngest brother was like seven or eight at the time. Um, so, the situation in our country was deteriorating on a day to day basis. Uh, my father saw that he had no other option but to just take us all and get out. And at the time. Uh, he had been promised, <laughs> he had been promised by someone in Germany that if you come and get your children and your wife and move, I promise you that I will get you permanent residencies in Germany in the span of a month. He had known that person um, from a long time ago, but they had lost contact. So he had known him a long while back, History. they had lo yeah, yeah they had lost contact at the time, and then they recontacted it, uh, recontacted each other, and then my father was like, you know what, what do we have to lose? He had a few left, uh, a few, a few, a, a small amount of money left in the bank, and he said, you know what, let's just take everything and uh, go to Germany. So we had applied to for the visas. We went. Um, we reached Germany in a car. I, I remember we drove across the continent a bit. Um, we were lucky to, to drive across the continent because I'm going to tell you about other people and how they reached. And then we reached that person's area of home and my dad goes like, okay, so what's next? And then he takes us all to a police station um, and he says, okay, well, you guys have to say that you're here and that you can't go back home. And he had told my dad right before we went to the police station that you can't take your passports or your money because they're not going to help you if you, if they see that you have some money with you. Uh, should I say how much money he had? What a, there's no need to mention at the time. Skip it. He had a bit of money, okay? And he said, just like, leave the money at home, leave the passports at home. And I saw the money and the passports being sewn into a teddy bear. I'm, 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 I'm going into a bit of details right now because you're going to understand well. Yeah. And he said, well, I'm going to take you to the police station. My dad, you know, knowing him for a long time, he trusted what, what was going on. He just so he was like, that's the way it has to go. Then that's the way it has to go. We went to that police station. Um... We said, like, we can't go home. We have nothing. And then they gave us papers to fill out. Me, my sister, my dad, my mom. I remember my younger brothers, they were under 18, so they didn't fill anything out. And I read on the paper the word asylum. And I look up and I say to my dad, I'm like, dad, this is an asylum application. He's like, sure. I'm like, it's an asylum application. He's like, what's an asylum? I'm like, it's a refugee app. It's like, we're applying to be refugees. He's like, no, 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 it's just part of the procedure. Don't worry, darling. It's okay, my wife, sure. I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, he's my father. I mean, I have to trust him. Uh, it wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault. So we applied for these, you know, we, we did those asylum applications. And that man just disappears. No longer replies to us. No longer contacts us. 
We had to stay at that police station for a good two nights um, in a cell, me and my family. It was basically a scam of some sort. It was a scam. Apparently it's common. <laughs> um, so after that, the police station, the police officers at that station had us transferred to a camp that was a four hour train ride away from that man's location. So we arrived to the camp. Um, keep in mind, we were in Lebanon. We were doing relatively okay. So we, we had like a roof over our heads. We had friends, family. We were in universities. We, we were getting our educations. We, everything was normal. But the prospect of German residency was intriguing. It's, uh, yeah, it was intriguing. And my family kind of saw the situation heading on a downward slope. So they were like, let us like, find a solution before things get worse. So we reached the camp and I just couldn't believe. Uh, we're talking about a span of two, two weeks where I was and then where I ended up. For, for, for some man who was just like not being completely truthful and honest. Um, <clears throat> we reached that camp. We enter a cell, another cell. Uh, it had three bunk beds. So it was me, my dad, my brothers, my mom, my sister, living in a room uh, for a good six months. Send me some pictures. I did. Is that what you're yeah, referring? That's, yeah, that's where we slept. Put it up on the screen now. Yeah. Uh, we were sleeping in these bunk beds. Um, I remember there was like a, a cage around the camp. Um, and we were not to cross that uh, I'm sorry, I mean gate. There was a gate around the camp and we were not to cross that after a certain hour. Um, we had group lunches uh, once a day with all the other refugees. Um, we would have like, some days would have like baked potatoes, some days would have just pasta, a plain pasta. Um, the situation kind of like it went 180 degrees in the span of two weeks. Uh, I clearly remember my my baby brother's face um, as we were entering that common space of where everyone eats. I remember his face, how he just starts to um, tear up. And so does my sister. And I just remember just like looking and just I wanted to say I'm sorry, like, I, I'm sorry that you are here. I can't do anything to help you. And knowing my nature that I just described, I'm a helper. Like, I, I have to help people. So when I saw my baby brother and the, the kind of, like, the situation that he was in, um, that, that broke me because my baby brother is someone I practically raised. There's a 13, 14 year difference between me and him. So seeing him in that situation broke my soul was it the birthday picture when the, he celebrated his birthday in we camp? celebrated his birthday in camp uh, but that wasn't the first thing though that was uh a month a month after probably a month yeah i mean the dates are kind of like vague in my head but yeah i mean that 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 image, that's the only thing I can think of when someone says refugee, like refugee camp. I think of my baby brother, um, what he had to go through, what we all had to go through. I think of the people that were there, the situation that the people were in there. Um, there's a story of, for example, a family who had to walk across Europe. You know swimmers, how they swam across the ocean and then they walked I think from Greece to Germany. The movie. That's real. Yeah. <laughs> that's not a movie. That's real. I, I I saw people who did that. But the movie is based on that. Yeah. Yeah. It's based on that. But some people might just like watch it and go like, oh, it's a movie. Yeah, it's not. It's it's real. <laughs> it's reality. This is this is something that exists. There's people out there dying and boats trying to cross uh, certain seas or oceans to get to safety. So and once they make land, that country has to protect them. They have to, yeah. And they can sometimes send them back. Depends on the country. There's uh, certain rules 
for each country. But I mean, Germany is a country that accommodates refugees pretty. It's the second largest, I guess, um, in the world that accommodates refugees after Turkey. Just to get this straight, you guys were there against your will. You couldn't leave it. No, we couldn't leave. We were there against our will. Um, we were fooled. You know, we were fooled to into being there. Um, it's a, it's a it's an experience that I will never forget in my life, and it's something that I want to take and see what I can do with to help to help those who are still there. I know people who are still there. I was just talking to them today, telling them I'm gonna be on a pretty popular podcast today to talk about my experience. And they were happy. They were so happy. They were like, say, tell them what's going on. Tell them what happened. Just speak up for us. They literally said that. I'm going to send you the voice when we're done. They said that. They said, we want you to showcase the reality of things. We want people to understand that this is not a movie. This is not just in series or just in, uh, I don't know, uh, a few Hollywood movies. It's reality. It's real life. And I saw it firsthand. I, I would have never imagined that I would be put in a place where I'd be in a refugee camp and live through with it and survive it. You know, it, it took a huge toll. And and when I say the story, I the first thing I'm scared, you know why I couldn't say it for two years? I was scared of people sympathizing or just like, feeling like, oh, I'm sorry I had to go through that. Don't be sorry that I had to go through that. It's it's something that millions of people are going through. It's something that you should be sorry if you're not aware of the situation, if you're not doing something to help. That's where you could say, I'm sorry, I'm not aware of the situation. Okay, I would understand that. But saying, I'm sorry, you have to go, you had to go through that. Why are you sorry? There's a tons of millions of people who are in this situation. A tons of, t- millions of children, millions of children whom my baby brother befriended <laughs> some of them during that time. They, they're, they're the exact same. They're children. They speak the same language. They're all innocent. They have no idea what, what's going on. They were playing in the swings together. They had no idea. Dealt a shitty hand. Yeah. And they had to live through it. They had to live through it, yeah. And the worst part is the being displaced and not having the power to go back home. Imagine you're sleeping at a friend's house. Let me simplify it. Imagine you're sleeping at a friend's house as a kid, as a teenager, I don't know, and you just want to go home. You know that feeling when you were a kid and you're sleeping at a friend's house and I just want to go home. Mom, come pick me up. I want to go home. Imagine not having your mom come pick you up and take you home for a good six months. Jail. Exactly. It's a glorified jail. Yeah. So, I so okay. So I need to go back to this guy who, who screwed you guys. Uh, clearly incentivized, probably you know probably has been. He's a sent- professional scammer. Most but, probably. But he made a buck off turning you guys in. Uh, you know, I have this family here. They shouldn't be free and roaming. Here you go, cops, and in return he has been incentivized. He's not going to do this shit for free. Was there any contact with this guy after you guys exited? No. Seriously? No, not not a single thing. Not He had blocked us everywhere. Um, if I worked to contact him, <laughs> is your podcast censored? <laughs> I'm censored. H- how? No, I would, I would, I wouldn't stop until he's, yeah. he's gotten what he is supposed to get until he, until there's some sort of consequence. In jail. In jail like we were for six months. And to do that to your father, you know, the history between them. I mean, that is some cold blood. I know. I know. That's really cold. Yeah. That was, um, that's not, the, that's not what, that's not the worst part. The worst part is he has a child. He has a child. A handicapped child. Him. Him. Okay. He has a handicapped child. Okay. And what's the relevance of that point? You did this to a child as well, who was my baby brother and my brother, other brother and my other sister. And me, I was 19. 
I was like, you have children, you have a child and you have a child who is helpless and you know what being helpless is like okay. when your child is helpless. You know you. that feeling. You. you put my father in that same position when he sees his child helpless and he can't, can't do anything about it. As an older sister, that destroyed me. It killed me. Kiflo, a father, a mother. Can you imagine? So I've no, I, we haven't contacted him. And I mean, I, I truly hope I don't see him. <laughs> truly. These are my, these are parts of my soul that you messed with. Yeah. It's not going to look pretty. Yeah, I'd worry you'd be in the real jail if you ever saw him. Exactly. <laughs> so it's best just not to see him. Exactly, yeah. Two years in the camp? No, that was six months in the camp. Six months in the camp. And then... Probably felt like two years. <laughs> felt like two decades. Felt like two decades. And then um, it was actually me and my sister who decided to take action to find an exit plan. Uh, I remember very clearly we had a curfew. Not only did we have a curfew, even within the hours where we were allowed to go out, we had a certain geographical area where we were not able to leave. So we had like a certain neighborhood we were supposed to stay in. And I remember telling my sister, Lejeune, I was like, Lejeune, uh, we need to find a solution. We can't live like this for any longer. She was like, you know what? Let's go find solutions. So we start Googling on our phones, like, where to go, who to talk to in this situation. We found uh, an organization. We took a train and we went to that city. It was like a 45 minute train ride. Uh, we weren't supposed to do that. So, I mean, that was kind of like worrying. What if we were caught? What if something happens? Uh, we, I don't I don't remember, I don't recall telling our parents even that we were to go to that organization. So we went. I remember the woman. I remember how she looked like. I even remember her name. God bless her soul, genuinely, wherever she is. I, I was, I've been trying to find her contact, but it, I couldn't do that. What did she do? She, she sent us back home. She sent us back home. I told her the entire story. She facilitated your exit. Everything. She's everything. Everything, everything. She got us the way back home. Did you sneak out of the camp? Yeah. It was like it was like escaping jail almost. I'm thinking 4 a.m. when no one's looking. No, no, no. That's not. It wasn't that intense. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't that intense. And the sniffer dogs are on that side. No, no, no. I wasn't that. Jumping intense. through lasers. I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically, we just had to exit that geogra geographical area where we're, we were not to exit. So if we were to be caught by authorities in the train, for example, because you know how they ask for your train tickets and your IDs. So what kind of IDs did we have? We had like a paper that said we we're in this camp. That's all we had. So if we were to show him that paper, he would know that you were, you're not supposed to be here. Back in the so, cage. No. Yeah. So that was kind of a scary ride uh, in that train, but we made it, we made it to that place. And she even told us like, how, how did you come here? <laughs> no one checked your tickets in the train or did you guys hide? No, no, sometimes, uh, you're lucky enough. Okay. No one, no one asks you anything. Most of the time. Sometimes when you're unlucky, Alhamdulillah, the officer lucky. shows up. Yeah. So we we got to that place. We spoke to that woman, and she just facilitated the entire ride back home. Uh, she got us the plane tickets. She gave us pocket money, to because we were living on a hundred a hundred euros per person. For for a, for a month. For a, for a month. Yeah. And how many people are you? Five. Five. Twenty euros each per month. No, that was a hundred per person. Per person per month. Per month, which is still nothing. Which is absolutely nothing. Nothing for a family of five. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, Who covers the cost of that and getting home and the tickets and all that? I think there's a social security network in Germany that's uh, very helpful of refugees. Got to applaud that. It's, yeah. Dude, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Uh, each person gets, it's a hundred euros, but I mean, it's still money. Um, alhamdulillah, uh, food that was provided. It was baked potatoes I was saying earlier, but alhamdulillah, it was food. Uh, I was mentioning what I was eating, not to say that, oh, haram, shufu, I was eating baked potato. No, it's to say that what you have on your table, pray to God 
and gratefulness for it. Genuinely. Genuinely. From the midst of my heart. Pray to God in gratefulness. Like, say, Alhamdulillah, I have a, I have a steak in front of me I'm eating. Yeah. Genuinely. Some people don't. I was one of these people. So, I mean... You came out of that with a whole newfound respect for life. Oh, yeah. Appreciation. Yeah, I mean... Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I wish you didn't have to go through it. Yeah, but. no, I mean, it's not just that. There, there was a negative aspect of getting out of that as well. But I'm working through it because I have to have no other choice, you know? That existential crisis, that uh, what is life about? Um, why did this happen? I, I worry about my siblings a lot uh, on the kind of uh, mental toll it took on them, especially my baby brother, who was a baby at the time. He had he had it the hardest between us all. Really? Yeah. What about today? Does he remember it? If I talk too much about him, I think I might like break down. <laughs> um, it's it's yeah, it's whatever. It's fine if you. Uh, that we're all human. Today. But but today, how is how is he today? Uh, Three years removed. Sorry. Take a second, and, and while you take a second, is it the innocence factor that gets you the most? Or was there something that happened in the camp with your brother that stays with you? Yeah, it was something that happened. It was something that happened. Not to him. Uh, he had, he had, he was robbed of his innocence. And then one night we were, I was trying to like put him to sleep. Um. And then he just looks at me and he says, I see a man on the door. Like, I see a man on the door, like someone's on the door. And I look at the door and there's no one. And then I realize that my brother's, <laughs> he's seeing things that are not there. And, and, and in that second, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do everything I can to help him get out of this horrifying Imagine seeing things that are not there. Like that's, I think it's a stress response or a trauma response that kids have, but he was robbed of something. Something died in my baby brother that, that I know him. You know, I know him before that happened and I know him after. And he's not the same kid. He's like 20 years older, oh. 20 years. Wallah al -azim. you sit with him. You can talk to him about anything you can talk to me about. He's so smart. He's intelligent. But at the same time, he was robbed. He was robbed of that innocence as a child. He was robbed of that of his happiness. Childhood. childhood. Thank you. He was robbed of his childhood. And nothing breaks me more about this whole story. Nothing bothers me more than Majd. Majd? Yani, I, I, honestly, the main reason I'm doing this is to raise awareness about it. And it's for Majd. Habibi. It's for Majd. I swear to God, I was telling my husband on the way here. I was like, Rani, do you think I'm doing the right thing? He was like, of course you are. You're helping others. You're helping Majd. I'm like, you know what? Yeah. Yeah. Majd is the main reason why I'm doing this. So I hope he gains strength, like some sort of strength when he watches me speaking about it. And speaking about it with all my bravery and the utmost level of courage I can put out in any topic is this. I've, it's, it's been two, three years I couldn't speak about it, but I'm doing it for him. So noble, honorable, righteous, brave. Wait, I can use all those words to describe a person that does something that's not for themselves. You know, the, yeah. the, and just to hear you say it's so selfless. It's everything I said, honorable, righteous, selfless, brave to talk about it. Because I, I don't think he's ever going to want to talk about it. So for you to step in and say, you know what? The, let me handle it. Yeah, let me tell the world what you've been through. You've been through enough. Let me, let me, let me, I saw it. Is, uh, you know, I, 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 I do believe uh, in whatever God takes away, God, God gives. Um, I have three cousins of mine and they're all hearing impaired. But those three people all went to Ivy League schools. 
and they are the smartest individuals I know today. They are some of the most pleasant people to be around. So they had a tough childhood. They didn't hear all through their life. Obviously, they were hearing aids now, but even with hearing aids, you're not hearing 100%. Yeah. They went through some hardships. But what the saying is, what, what the Lord taketh away, the Lord giveth. Yeah, 100%. So I live by it. God took something away from you and Majd, but inshallah, you'll see that he will give you something in return that is inshallah far greater. I hope so. I genuinely hope so. I really hope so. That's how the world works. Yeah. And if not in this life, then in the afterlife. Inshallah. We touched on spirituality inshallah, earlier. Of course, inshallah. I hope that Majd sees the learn, takes the learning from it and knows that it's okay. It's okay. How old, how old is he now? He's 13. 13. Yeah. Will you have him watch this episode? Yes, I will. Yeah. Of course I will. Yeah. He's, I think he's wise enough to do so. I'm interested to know if you had the ability to change one thing in the world, again, open-ended, if you could change something in the world that really gets under your skin, what would it be? A lack of awareness on so many things. I mean, there's a lot of misinformation that goes on. There's a lot of um, lack of awareness on so many detrimental and essential things. Uh, people are usually, and I can't blame people. You mean, you mean, they're time consumed. They're consumed by their jobs, by their lives. Uh, I think I would change how we look at horrible things that happen around the world in a way that's a bit more practical, a bit more pragmatic. So I would increase the pragmatism when it comes to like helping others. You know what? I, I mean, I'm not an angel. I'm not a saint speaking about, I want to help others. I want to do this. I want to do that. No, I genuinely do believe if each and every single individual contributes as little as giving the the talabat or the jahaz driver a bottle of water when he comes to the door. I think that kindness, it will go a long, long, long way. I really do. I believe in that. I believe in that. And yeah, I mean, making someone smile or making someone's day by that small gesture. I think I would like to see more of that. So it's missing, right? Yeah. Kindness. Kindness. We, I, uh, where Where's the kindness I used to see when I was a kid? There was a lot of bad things that happened too, like the bullies and <laughs> so many horrible things happening all the time. But people were kind to each other before all this, the, the social media revolution that we're witnessing right now. It's crazy. It's crazy. You know, if, if you were penalized or if you had to pay a penalty for every negative thing that you say on social media to a person and the penalty is now you have to say it to their face <laughs> it just came to me 99 percent of those keyboard warriors would not exist they will sprint out of that room i yeah i know that yeah i know that i mean i'm sure you had have you had like some of that experience of people like saying negative things about you. Have you had that? About the podcast, yeah. I talk in Arabic. I want to eat a fish. Why is it a fish? I wish I was an animal. I, I wish I was an animal. You know, I'd have no worry in the world. I'll take the fish part. That's for damn sure. But yeah, speak Arabic, speak Arabic. You know, two people, two Saudis speaking English. Why do you speak Arabic out of curiosity? The idea was that I did not like how mainstream media was portraying the country. Okay. I did not like it when I lived in the States 20 years ago, and I didn't like it when the idea came to me in right. 2020. And through the power of decentralized media, I felt that we have an opportunity today to own and tell the narrative, and that's what I'm trying to do. Amazing. I love it. What's something that the people get wrong about you? That I am a uh, show-off. Show-off? Yeah, I get that a lot, actually. In what way are you show-off? I don't know. They th they think I'm a show off. They think I'm kind of like rude. Also, I I think it's because I'm I'm blunt. Point. I'm just blunt. Like I say things as they are. I call them as they are. So people kind of like um, 
feel like I'm, I'm a bit overwhelming when it comes to my personality. So I don't think it's that bad. <laughs> I think those that know you would say that you are real. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what's missing that I think in the world, along with kindness, I think realism. You think so? Yeah. I think social media has created more fakeness. Like those who are on the fence yeah. have become, I, I mean, I, like when I'm posting something on Instagram and, you know, there's 15 filters to choose from. Like, how about just no? Why don't we just, you know, and I <laughs> always end no. up like, how about this or that? Or, I think social media has given the opportunity to those who are on the fence between being real and being fake. You think so? To like be pulled into the fake side that has maybe reflected. Definitely stems from insecurity, in my opinion. It stems from insecurity. For sure. So, um, I mean, I had to learn to grow that sense of security in myself. I, I, I wasn't born with it. But I was conscious of the fact that I need to I need to be secure. I need to be confident. I need to know what I'm saying. I need to be blunt and honest. That was the one thing my dad always told me. I would not have any kind of um uh, uh, I don't know how to call it in English in my house. Going around in circles. Going around in circles, go, beating around the bushes. Yes. That's a no. That's what it is beating around. It, beating around the bush. Yeah. That's a no in my house. So I kinda learned that from my dad. Good. Good. <laughs> I'm blunt. I call I respectfully I say things as they are and that kind of like portrays me as someone who's too intense or show off or rude or <laughs> and if you found out that someone doesn't like you would that bother you not one percent why why would that even like well how is that adding to my life that's the question i ask how is what kind of value is that bringing to my life you don't like me okay it's your problem. no not even your problem that's a that's nothing like how is that benefiting you or causing you any kind of trouble or causing me any kind of trouble? That's just a fact. I'm okay with it. I don't want people to like me. I, um, I was the complete opposite. Because you told me in the beginning you were sensitive. I was so sensitive. I was a people's pleaser. I, if someone told me I don't like you, oh my God, that would be the end of the world. So it changed. Oh yeah, it flipped. What was the turning point? My father. My father. He taught me that you shouldn't seek anyone's approval. And he taught me that, he taught me to take value off of every single person in my life. It's not, it's not being, uh, what's the word for it? Maslahji. It's not being like... Uh, opportunistic. Op yeah, it's not being opportunistic. It's being smart with your relation relationships, with the people around you. And they don't necessarily all have to have some sort of thing that you're gaining from. But from this podcast, I learned... Two things from you, two, two statements that you told me that I didn't know before. I value this conversation. If a conversation does not bring anything or does not put anything on the table, I don't care about it. So ergo, I don't care if you're my friend or not. Do you see what I mean? So I kind of learned that um, the hard way. The hard way I learned that after a lot of disappointments from so many friends and so many people. But... Uh, the hard way is hard, but not as hard as the easy Not way. as hard as the easy way. <laughs> <laughs> came back. Yeah, exactly, it came back. So, yeah, I mean... It makes sense now, doesn't it? It does. No, no, it does. That's one thing I learned. That's, I just told you, I learned two things I didn't know from you before. And that's one sentence that I was like, wow, that resonates a lot, you know, with me and with my life. Um, if you have people around you who think that you're... Who think anything of you that's not nice... Why have these people around? Exactly. Why? Why? Give me one good reason. There isn't. There isn't. There isn't. Just cut them off. Yeah. They're bringing you more damage than they are good. So. so the best revenge is living well. Exactly. Next question. It's not a question. It's more like finish the sentences. <laughs> okay. Like I want a game show. <laughs> I feel most alive when? When I'm with my husband. God bless you and him. <laughs> Is that you're safe, happy, like nothing oh, yeah. can bother you no matter what, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Nothing yeah. more rewarding than a home full of love, you know? Like it's there's a few things that... Uh, he is my home. He is your home. Yeah, he really is my home. I, I mean, I'm not going to say that it's all butterflies and roses. It's not like uh, every single marriage has its ups and downs. But no matter what stage we're at when I'm with him... I'm home, I'm safe, I'm happy, I feel loved, I can give love unconditionally. It feels like I'm in a safe safe place. Yeah. 
and it's one of the few things along with a fit body children that love you but a home full of love is one of the few things that you cannot buy exactly you have to earn it's priceless it's priceless, it's priceless. it does not have a price definition not priceless not at all yeah except if you're doing like couples therapy yeah. well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then there's a price <laughs> but no yeah what you're saying is completely true you gotta earn it yeah oh, gotta everyone earn. wants i want a six pack you know but if i read I, I gotta earn it i can't go to the mall and buy one exactly no you have to work hard you for gotta it. work hard and marriage it's is hard, hard it's work hard. it's hard work it's hard yeah um, i mean i'm sorry no i mean i we don't have kids yet we are planning to have kids and i'm already we are already investing in just learning about how to raise kids Beautiful. and the books before you even have them huh before we even have them i have three books at home i want to read Beautiful. so i think that kind of investment of the time and effort is what's required we, we're learning how to communicate, me and him. We speak different love languages. So we're learning how to find that balance. You know, it's not, been e it's, it's not easy. It's a lot of work. But if you have the will, both of you have the will, you can accomplish anything, anything, literally anything. You can be a power couple. You can help each other. You can raise each other up. He raises me when I'm down. I, I'd like to believe I do so too. Um, even in business, we talk business to each other. We talk financials. We talk about how to grow with each other in terms of business, how to make, you know, the fortune that we dream of making together as a, as a, as a team, um, how I can help, how he can help. We're a team. We're in a, we're in a partnership. Everything you just said right now about learning how to raise kids you didn't have, talking financials, you know, the, the stuff that maybe nine out of 10 couples do not talk about, they deal with it when it slaps them in the exactly. face. My wife and I today say we wished we had those conversations mm. because we ended up going, learning the hard way. That's okay too. That's okay too, honestly. I would have, my advice to anyone today, like a younger cousin comes up to me more, what advice do you have about marriage? I appreciate the question because I didn't ask anyone yeah. the question about, you know, what advice having kids, marriage, being a father, what can you tell me that I can incorporate in my life as opposed to learning the hard way? Yeah. Um, so you and your husband are really approaching it. You don't need me to tell you this, um, but but I will because I didn't approach it the right way. Yeah. So you approached it the right way and you guys have a very good head on your shoulders and I know that you guys will make great parents. Each other. I hope so. I really hope so. Yeah. We're, we're, we're still doing our best, you know? And I believe in what you said, that you can accomplish anything you want as long as you put the time. Are you willing to invest in putting the time into working towards it? Because anything, you can do anything you want if you're willing to put in the time. You know why most people, I believe, for example, they um, most people succeed in businesses. They make a lot of money. I truly believe that... A good amount of people who don't is because they don't put the time. They don't have the will. They don't say, you know what? I'm going to wake up tomorrow. I'm going to start on a new business plan. I'm going to start. If you don't have the capital scouting for investors, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And they actually put a plan and they're consistent. You can do it. Honestly, if uh, I mean, if anyone can do it, I think you can do it as well. Consistency beats hard work every day. I kid. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. The thing I value most in my life today. My family. I mean, if you asked me this like a few years ago, I would have said probably like, I don't know, something something about traveling or... But no, I think the family, that feeling of being a part of a larger um, group of people who you would die for, <laughs> I think that's the best thing in the world. Knowing that they have your best interest at heart they would never hurt you. I'm talking about the dark for like the mom, father, and siblings, my husband. Um, that's the most, that's precious to me. That's priceless, genuinely. That's the most important thing. Next comes traveling. <laughs> I'm glad that was second. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I knew this when I was younger. <clears throat> I wish I knew when I was younger that not how do how do i say this nicely <laughs> how about you say it the way you feel it people can be 
<laughs> I, agree. I agree. I wish I knew at a younger age not to go all the way with a friend or trust so easily and just like want people's, you know, um, acceptance. And I wish I knew that at an earlier age. It would have saved me a lot of, not for anything. I, if I were to go back, I would have done the exact same thing to learn. But I mean, it would just save me some time and some bad days maybe. Yeah. <laughs> we spend a lot of our growing up years worried about what people are thinking about us. And then when we grow up, we realize that no one was thinking about us exactly. anyway. <laughs> That's so true. The, is that a paradox or is that a... It's, I think it's human nature. It's, I think it's human nature. Yeah. That's a nice bit of advice to to give children today. Yeah. Don't worry about, about, about what people think. People are too busy. In the, no one's thinking about you. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Like if you think about who you were thinking about as a child, you wouldn't think of anyone specific that you would think about all the time. So that would apply to most people. Everyone's busy with their own shit. Yeah, exactly. Oh, exactly. Busy. Exactly. Even, especially as children, I was just, honestly, I was busy with what I'm going to have for dinner, like the endomie that my mom would make. <laughs> like add more spices. <laughs> and then what time I'm going to sleep. No, I don't want to go to sleep now. Like I, I wasn't, I was too busy doing other things like my homework or I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, no. It's the it's 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 most of us at a younger age. You I know, think that's so? where. Uh, I mean, I, one of the best things about childhood is 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 being worry free to a certain extent. Yeah. Not having to worry about everything you do as an adult. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's part of being a yeah. That's part of being a child. What would your sixteen-year-old self be so surprised to learn about you today? Or not so surprised, just surprised. That I'm, um, I think it's mostly the fact that I don't really, I'm, I'm not really attentive to what people think about me anymore. Because that used to consume a lot of my time and my thoughts. A lot. Like it was really, really consuming at the time. So I feel like um, that 16 year old would be like, whoa. <laughs> like it, also the fact that I was a C student, CB student, um, that 16 year old would also be kind of like shocked at where I am right now. <laughs> How did you do that <laughs> with a C every single year? <laughs> I can relate. Yeah. Um, but you can do that. Even if you're a C student watching this, just put the effort in. It's all about how you present yourself. It's about how you sell yourself to companies and to recruiters. Doesn't matter what your grades were. They don't care. It's encouraging, right? They don't care. If you fail in school, it doesn't mean it's the end of your life. Oh, no, it does not. But no, that's the, not. the school. We're not system. encouraging anyone to fail in school. No, no, no. <laughs> but but, but if, if you happen to be a, a C-plus student, yeah. uh, don't beat yourself up about it thinking that I'm never going to amount to anything. Exactly. I think schools are, the systems are designed in a way where, I mean, you can only see your true potential when you're out there and working after school. Because you could suck at math, but then you could be a genius in biology or any yeah. other subject and that's where you would excel in life so if you're kind of like not getting the perfect grades in a certain class or subject don't beat yourself up about it you're most likely not going to end up doing anything related related to that subject and yeah that was my case have you heard of the saying that you are the average of the five people who are closest to you yes so what do you think of that against segregation in school based on intelligence? Can you repeat that question? Yeah. So in school, in England, there were five maths class. Right. I was in the weakest one. Mm. E, A, B, C, D, mm. E. I even remember. So that's American, right? That's an English. American. English. In, okay. In, in, the st in the States, it wasn't that. It was we're all together like a mixed salad. It was fantastic. <laughs> but in, in England, the to be politically correct here, the least brightest were in the weakest class and the most intelligent were in the top class. So you, bad eggs, <laughs> you guys stay here. Drop my pen. And you <laughs> smart ones that will go to Oxford and Cambridge, we need you guys here and not to be, uh, what's the word, infected by those who are less... At least that's how it felt yeah. to those in E, to, yeah. to, to us that were in E. So 
where do you draw the line on how condescending that is? <laughs> how maybe even manipulative, like, you know, it's, it's an indirect admission that you are not intelligent. So please don't affect those who are. And I live like the the rotten fruit that will affect the rest of the because you you I I left that school thinking that I'm not that intelligent. I'm not this, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. But if it wasn't for that mix, I'm telling you that our standards, there is more of a chance of our standards to raise, because if you are the average of the five people closest to you. Sorry, just the that's It's okay. I'm confident that if it wasn't that way and if it was mixed, it's like if you play tennis with a pro compared to playing someone who is worse than you. You're never going to progress. Exactly. You're yeah. going to end up being better when you play against a pro who kicks your ass every day. Exactly. So that's where I'm coming from. Condescending, putting the non-brights together and the brights together. It does no good. I'm just learning from you that uh, that's how it was. That's how it was. And you know what's really sad? It still is that way. What? It still is that's that way. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Segregation based on intelligence. I, I believe in healthy competition. I believe that the school system is dated. Yeah, 100%. 100%. And you're not putting that person in a room to grow or to learn from those who are growing. So how, how the hell is he going to yeah. progress? Same thing with work sometimes. You know, I mean, when you're, when you're in a certain institution as an employee... And you see some employees that are outperforming you. And at the same time, you're seeing some employees that are not really doing that well. Who are you going to look at to learn? True. You're going to look at the ones who are outperforming you, even if it's a bit annoying. I believe in healthy competition. I believe that it has contributed a lot to my improvement. I'm someone who's a fast learner. I learn so quickly and I improve so quickly. Um, this is crucial, crucial to be put in a in the real world in school, you know what I mean? Like, this is the real world when you're out of school. You're up there with everyone. There's no, there's no like segregation in terms of intelligence at work. I mean, uh, yeah, you have access to all of these people, even if they're above you in a certain position or below you in a certain position, but you have the access to communicate with them and to see how they're doing it, to learn from them, etc. I believe that should be in school as well. I find that crazy. Yeah, it is. I find that crazy, to be honest. I mean, if you think about it, in the last 200 years, the schooling method of operation is the only thing that hasn't changed. You have 20 kids looking up at a teacher. Yeah. The payment system, currency has changed. We went from paper to digital. Retail, how that has changed. We used to go to shops and now we get it online. Food, I think we're eating healthier food, or at least we have access to organic. So that oh, behavior yeah. has changed. Uh, access to therapy that was probably non-existent 200 years ago. It was taboo. <laughs> it was taboo. Forget about 200 years ago, 30 years ago. Yeah. When taboo. my parents were in their 30s and 40s. But the schooling system. Still the same? It's still very medieval. You think so? Hasn't changed. I think the only thing that changed was the ruler hitting, the like when they used to hit the hands with the, did you ever yeah, experience yeah. that? Yeah, I couldn't then finish. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I remember. Yeah. I won't, I won't sorry. Any names, but yeah, I remember <laughs> getting getting a beating. Oh my goodness! You know what's really unfair? The testing system, where you study all year long, and if you have an off day on the test or you don't test well, that also can be very condescending. Yeah. If you are a B plus A student, and then on the last day you flunk the final, and you yeah. end up with a D. Unnecessary pressure. I know. So the whole system of schooling as you can tell, is very close to my heart and I feel need to read it. <laughs> With that in 10 years, final question. Um, so, usually when I picture myself in 10 years, I got nothing. I don't know where I'm going to be in 10 years. I think... Where do you want to be? I want to I wanna be happy. You know, I want to be content. I am, alhamdulillah, I'm content. But I want to be like, achieved to a certain extent a career wise i'm very very driven by my career um i want to have a happy family i want my husband to be happy and content with our marriage um i want to have kids i want to see my kids where they're going to be at in 10 years um i want my family to be in good health and shape and also me and my husband and challah our kids to be in good health and shape so i want to have like that you know you know what i love you just wished for 
everything that is non-materialistic stuff that matters, stuff that counts. <laughs> not I did I say I'm to. career driven, though. To be fair, that's fine, career driven. But like you didn't say, I want a big house, and you know, I want us to live in this part, and I and I want uh, you know j- the the material things that 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 often we get sucked into yeah. as shallow dreaming. You 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 envisioned a healthy family, yeah, a, a good relationship with your husband. Again, things that you can't buy. You yeah, gotta, exactly. You got to earn, and exactly. And that's. Is there anything more meaningful than that? Though the other things are a plus. I'm not gonna lie. The other things are a plus, inshallah. But if I don't have them and I have that, like the health, the good health, a happy family, I'm, I'm more than okay. Yeah. I'm genuinely. You'll be. Really you'll. You'll also be rich in other ways. Of course, yeah. it's rich is a mindset. It's a mindset. Yes. Genuinely, yeah. I don't believe in that. <laughs> thank you by the way for this talk this has been very very refreshing I really hope it was I genuinely do hope it was go on we can just go on <laughs> I, 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 mean, I don't know you, you, you had that. but no it was it was. It went in so many different directions and it's already been two hours how about that oh my god 10 yeah 30 10 30 it's been already two yeah. hours well let's leave something for the next time we cross paths inshallah thank you for opening up about some very heavy things that you know not every heart can take and i'm happy i did it with you Mo. thank Genuinely. you so much it means a lot that you chose to come on my platform i I, I cannot thank you enough um you you're a great storyteller you you took me to what life was like during the the, the dark days in, in lebanon during the refugee camp in, in in germany and and honestly the line that comes to mind is that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger a hundred percent that's my motto <laughs> that is my motto that what doesn't kill you it makes you stronger point and you're very brave oh thank you <laughs> very brave thank you very much anyone that's willing to you know hold a mic uh, in 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 the middle of you know what many would deem as a war zone not knowing where the next bomb can go off that's brave that's courageous pretty hard you know for the sake of getting the truth out there yeah you risked your life. Not even for your own sake. It's for the sake of the people. Sake, yeah. Yeah. So thank you. You're very everything. welcome. I'm very, very happy to be here. I really, really appreciate, you know, this uh, platform and allowing me the chance to talk about what I've been through. And I'm super proud of this podcast and what it's achieving genuinely. And I really hope you reach the, the places where you want to reach. And so much. Yeah. Thank you. I really do hope. All the best for you as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.